Step 2. Electromagnetic wave equation. In this step, we will derive the electromagnetic wave equation, show that light is in fact an electromagnetic wave, and then also think about how we can produce electromagnetic waves. So let's begin. In this step, we will consider free space, meaning that there are no sources of charges, no sinks of charges, and also no current density. In particular, what that means is that our vector j, the current density, will be zero in Maxwell's fourth equation, and also the divergence uh, of the electric field will be zero. So, let's start from Maxwell's third equation, which tells us how the curl of the electric field is related to the time derivative of the magnetic field. And now we would like to express both sides in terms of the electric field. There's a little trick what, uh, that we're going to apply, and that is we're going to take the curl of both sides. So, on the left-hand side, we just have the curl of our curl of the electric field, and on the right-hand side, we're going to have the minus time derivative of the curl of the magnetic field. But we know how the curl of the magnetic field is related to the time derivative of the electric field. So, let's just substitute our Maxwell's fourth equation. And remember that we are set in this scenario, we are considering free space, meaning that there is no current density. So we can safely set j to be equal to zero. So uh, upon substitution, what we get is the following. We get the curl of the curl of E is equal to minus mu naught times epsilon naught times the second order time derivative of the electric field. So we are done with uh, massaging the right-hand side. Now we have to apply some identities to the left-hand side to simplify this expression. The following identity is a very useful identity. And it says that the curl of a curl of a vector field, in this case our electric field, is related to the gradient of the divergence of the vector field minus the Laplacian applied to the electric field. But remember, we said that we are in free space. So just like the current density j is zero, so is the divergence of the electric field. So we can safely forget about the first term because it vanishes. So all we are left with is minus the Laplacian applied to the electric field, and upon substitution into our previous um, equation, we get the following. We get that the Laplacian applied to the electric field is equal to mu naught times epsilon naught times the second order time derivative of electric field. This is a familiar form that you should recognize by now. This is an wave equation, and it tells us that the electric field in fact is, uh, satisfies a wave equation. Similarly, we could have started from Maxwell's fourth equation rather than, its thir than his third equation, and we would have arrived at the same expression, same wave equation for the magnetic field. This shows that uh, electric and magnetic field are very closely related, and they both are a wave. That is why we talk about electromagnetic waves. What's also interesting is that they both propagate at the same speed. This mu, it's related to mu naught times epsilon naught, the permeability of free space times the permittivity of the free space. So, let's have a closer look at what this speed tells us. We can also write the wave equation in terms of its x, y, and z components, just to be sure that really all components propagate at the same speed. And this speed is given by the following. We know from the general form of the wave equation that the Laplacian of a vector field is related to 1 over v squared times the second order time derivative of the vector field. Therefore, the speed of propagation for our electromagnetic wave is given by 1 over the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught. So when Maxwell derived this expression, people could measure the permeability and the permittivity of free space. So they were well aware and had pretty good estimates of the actual values. These values are given by the following. Mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 meters times kilograms per coulomb squared. This C is notation for coulombs. While the permittivity of free space, epsilon naught, is given by 8.85 times 10 to the minus 18 and this complicated unit, second squared times kilograms over meters cubed times kilograms. In fact, the kilograms can cancel. 
When you substitute that in, you get a remarkable result. You get that the speed of propagation of an electromagnetic wave is approximately 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Do you recognize this value? This value is in fact the speed of light. At the time when Maxwell derived this equation, people could also uh, measure the speed of light and they had a pretty good idea of what it was. So this is a remarkable result that Maxwell showed that light is in fact an electromagnetic wave. Therefore, from now on, we will not use the symbol V for the speed of propagation of electromagnetic waves, but we will use the standard C. So, let's consider a plane wave traveling in z-direction, just to give us a little bit of uh, practice and confidence that uh, um, the plane waves that we are considering for electric and magnetic fields, in fact, do satisfy the uh, wave equation. So, if the wave is traveling in the z-direction, we know that the electric field can vary only in the x and y directions. It cannot have any varying component in the z-direction. Therefore, its component in z is zero. And now what we do, we substitute this expression for our field E into the wave equation. On the left-hand side, we get the Laplacian, and again, it's just re related uh, by uh, minus k squared times the electric field E. And on the right-hand side, when we compute the second-order time derivative, we get minus omega squared times E. And we know from the relationship between the angular frequency and the wave vector k that omega is equal to C times k. In other words, the wave equation is satisfied. So that's good. Now, we have to answer a very important question. How do we produce these electromagnetic waves? To answer that, we start by considering an electric field of an accelerating charge. Imagine that this red ball uh, represents our charge, and this line over here is one of its electric field lines. Now, when the, constant, when the electric field is constant, there is no magnetic field. We know that from Maxwell's equations. Now what we do is we displace our charge vertically, so we accelerate it upwards. What that does is basically it creates a kink in the electric field line. So at this position over here, the electric field line doesn't know that we have changed the position of the charge. The signal could not have propagated there yet. So the electric field line looks a little bit like this. There is a kink. And as we uh, move the charge downwards, we create this pulse. Now, because the electric field is varying in time, this gives rise to a constant um, magnetic field. Furthermore, if this change in time of the electric field is non-uniform, it gives a non-uniform uh, magnetic field. In other words, it creates, creates a pulse that's traveling down uh, through space. Now, we know that Maxwell's first equation describes the electric field around a charge. So, in order to create electromagnetic waves, we need to accelerate the charge, because accelerating charges produce a change in electric field, which leads to a changing magnetic field, as we know from Maxwell's fourth equation. But, Maxwell's third equation tells us that a changing magnetic field produces a changing electric field. So, that feeds back into uh, the change in electric field, producing a change in the magnetic field, and so on and so forth in a circle. And this maintains the electric wave, and it's able to propagate through space. So, if we just keep oscillating our, our uh, little point charge, this will create a nice uh, uh, harmonic electromagnetic wave like that. So, this image is not very accurate, because it's only for one dimension. Now let's move to two dimensions and see what really happens. Again, we've got our point charge sitting in the middle, and we've got all these field lines emanating out of the charge, or towards it, depending on the, on, on the sign of the charge. Now what happens? We know that if we let the charge sit there without moving or without acceleration, then we have only a static electric field, meaning there is no electromagnetic wave. So what we do is we accelerate the charge. We accelerate it in the horizontal direction from point O to point O1. It takes us time from T0 to T1 to do it, and then we let the charge travel at a constant speed. 
So we said that if the charge is accelerating, it creates a kink in the line. In particular, all of these field lines of the electric field outside of this circle, they are the original lines that were there for when the charge was at point O in the center. These field lines don't know that we have accelerated the charge because the information has not reached them yet. This distance is given by C times T2, while the distance uh, when we stopped accelerating the charge and we moved it at a constant speed is given by C times T2 minus T1. And you see, because these field lines, they have to, they have to join together to, to produce a continuous field line, there is this kink uh, in the electric field. And it's this kink that is the electromagnetic wave. Notice that this wave, this pulse or this kink is produced only when the charge is accelerating. There are no kinks while the charge is moving at a constant speed. Also notice that the biggest change or the biggest kink is given for the field lines that are here. In other words, that are in the orthogonal direction uh, compared to in which direction we move the charge. Meaning that if you are looking directly at the charge as, it, as, as it's accelerating towards you, you don't see any electromagnetic wave. All these electromagnetic waves are only produced in a cone up and in a cone down, but not in the line in which the acceleration happened of the charge. 